Hi everyone, it's Dr. Jamie here, here to talk about one of my favorite things in the world, which is virginity in American popular culture. So let's get started. Today, we're going to talk about some things that you're probably already familiar with and some concepts you're probably already familiar with, even if you haven't heard them put in these terms before. So our main topic today is something called the virgin whore dichotomy. So if you don't know, a dichotomy is any time that you're presented with only two options. So uh, apple or orange, um, A or B. You, some of you might be familiar with the phrase dichotomy from your writing classes in which you learned about logical fallacies because one of the most common logical fallacies is called a false dichotomy. So a false dichotomy is when an argument says that there are only two choices which you have to pick from when in reality in almost everything in life there's way more than two choices so even with that quick description you probably can already guess what the virgin whore dichotomy is the virgin whore dichotomy is this presentation of women as if there are only two categories of women there's the virgin or the good woman and the whore or the bad woman and in reality women as we know are people and so there are as many types of women as there are types of people. So the virgin whore dichotomy is essentially a false dichotomy, but it's also a trope um, that we see in pop culture over and over again. So we see the theme, we see characters that fit this pattern in pop culture repeatedly. So um, I'll try and give you a couple of examples. So when I was in high school, one of the clearest examples of this trope was in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So Buffy was the virginal character. And after the first season, she wasn't a literal virgin um, because it's important to note that this trope in pop culture doesn't rely on whether you are literally having sex or not. It really has to do more with a shorthand of categorizing women as bad or good. And we're going to dig into that a little bit more later. So Buffy was the virginal character because she was the good character. She sought to uphold order. She often did what she was told. And the bad character was Faith. So Faith dressed all in black and she questioned orders and she didn't do things by the book. Um, and so she was the bad character or the whore. Um, particularly in American pop culture, I can't speak to other countries, but you can often tell the virgin whore dichotomy at a glance and I mean a literal glance because often um, the virgin is lighter so uh, like Buffy was blonde and Faith had dark hair or another example if we look at the secret life of the American teenager which I analyzed to talk about the virgin whore dichotomy in my dissertation the main character Amy even though she's had sex is the virginal character she's the good girl and she has light brown hair and she's white whereas the whore character who has a lot of sex and doesn't take sex seriously and talks about her pleasure is Adrian right and Adrian is Latina and she's got dark skin and dark hair um, so racism, it's a thing. It combines with patriarchy and American pop culture to do some fucked up shit. So you, hopefully you can start to think through, um, maybe how the virgin whore dichotomy appears in some of your favorite popular culture. So once you start to look for it, there are examples everywhere of essentially the good woman and the bad woman, the virgin and the whore. And so again, this isn't literal. In a lot of pop culture, the virgin character like Buffy or like Amy has had sex, but they often have less sex. They often talk less about sex. And in particular, they talk less about their pleasure in sexuality. Um, so those are some things to note if you're looking at a television show and you're thinking, who is the virgin here? Um, it doesn't mean it's a character who has never had sex. There are very few of those in modern pop culture. Um, it is much more about who is the good character, who upholds order, who upholds values, and the bad character associated with being the whore is going to be who questions authority, um, who causes problems by questioning authority. And again, sometimes it really just as simple as um, 
colorism or white versus a person of color or if it's two people who are the same race and ethnicity who is physically lighter or has lighter hair um so those are some things to watch out for if you're looking at pop culture and thinking is there a virgin whore dichotomy in this the answer is one probably yes and those are some keys how to figure it out so as always our most important question is why is any of this important and I'm going to answer that in sort of two ways. So first, the things that we see in media have impact in our lives. So that doesn't mean that if you play a first person shooter game that you are going to be irresponsible with guns and hurt someone. That's called media determinism and that's also a logical fallacy. We have no studies that back up that kind of um, causation right, that media causes people to do things. However, we do know that media is a way that people internalize values. Media helps tell you what is and isn't normal. This is why people who want to make change often try to start change with the media so that people can see different things as normal. I'll give you an example that's kind of related to my research um, a couple of years ago in California where uh, most porn in the U.S. is produced. They tried to pass a local bill saying that all porn performers had to wear condoms and the reason for that was to make condoms sexy because people see that porn performers don't wear condoms and they think that to have good sex you don't wear a condom and so the logic behind that bill was if people see porn performers wearing condoms, they'll associate condoms with good sex and they'll be more likely to have sex with condoms. So the media does influence our behavior and we know that, which is why we often try and change media to reflect the values that we want to have. But when you ask people who produce media, why do you produce media the way that you do? What they will often say is we pull from real life examples. And so um, you get this tension, right, with people saying, hey, media, do a better job at representing women or representing safe sex practices or people of color, or people with disabilities. Um, and the media will say, well, we just represent things the way that they are. And in reality, there's a kind of these things are mutually constitutive, right? They affect each other. So certainly people who write and make media are pulling from their real life experiences and the things that they have seen. But in creating that media, they also kind of normalize those things because people see it and think, oh, this is what a normal interaction is like. So that is part of why this is important because the virgin whore dichotomy wouldn't be in our media if it didn't already exist in our culture. So that's one reason that it's important to talk about. But also, the virgin whore dichotomy is perpetuated through media because it teaches people, young men, young women, people of all ages, sexes, and genders, that this is how you judge a woman's worth. So to further understand this, I want to dig into some really yummy theoretical concepts from one of my favorite philosophers, um, well, actually political theorists. So his name is Antonio Gramsci, um, and he lived in times very much like ours. So he lived in a country that was changing a lot and very fast, and it made people uncomfortable. Um, he lived under a fascist leader and he wrote about politics and he criticized his government and he spent a lot of his life in jail and he continued to write about politics from jail and so he kind of came up with this thing or developed this concept um, called hegemony and so hegemony is a funny word and most of us kind of know what it means, even if we haven't had that word. I personally always look up the exact definition because I can tell you, oh, hegemony is kind of like this and it's kind of like that. So here's the exact definition. It is the idea that the ruling class can manipulate the value system of a society so that their views become the world view. So in some ways, this is the perfect time to have this discussion because Many of us are at home, either in kind of self-isolation or practicing social distancing because COVID-19 has disrupted 
our regular systems. And I don't know about your social media, but on mine, a lot of people are questioning things that were previously kind of considered normal. So for instance, um, in a public health crisis like this, it would be really beneficial if we had some sort of national system for everyone to get testing and get time off so that they could socially isolate and not risk contaminating the people they work with or their clients um, and know whether or not they were infected. That's not something we have in the United States because our cultural hegemony or ideas for a long time has been that healthcare is tied to your job. Right. So if you have a certain type of job, you have health care. And if you don't have that type of job, you don't have great access to health care. And that has been normal for most of us, certainly for me, for my whole life. Um, and I think for my mom for her whole life, you know, that's been the normal in the United States for a very long time. And so what you'll notice in that example is hege hegemony doesn't mean that people aren't criticizing it, because certainly there have been people speaking out against the way that our health care system works for a long time, right? But it does mean that the system is set in place by those who benefit from it. And a lot of us live with it and come to think of it as normal, right? So related to this idea of hegemony that Gramsci really developed, he created this idea of common sense. And so common sense in a Gramscian way is a little different from how you and I would use the term amongst each other. So Gramscian common sense is the mechanism by which the ruling class kind of structures the values of the working class. And working class here is not strictly Marxist working class, it's just everyone who's not a member of the ruling class. So, Common sense in this Gramscian way is things that seem obvious to us because we don't know another way, right? So again, if you're watching this video, if you're going to college because you want to get a good job because you want to have a good life for your family, that's actually its own example of cultural common sense. Because although I was certainly raised with that, um, and I, as a first generation student, went to college to get a good degree, to get a better job than anyone in my family had had, to make more money, to kind of like bring us up as a family. Like that was the idea. Um, that is not the way the world has to be, right? So um, again, going back to the fact that um, coming to you live from my home office with my refrigerator in the background, thanks to COVID-19, um, both parties, the Democrat and Republican Party, are talking about a universal monthly income to get us through this time, right? So we could have, we could live in a system where everyone just had a universal monthly income and universal health care and you did what you loved, right? That's not something we've been raised with. It seems like kind of a foreign idea, um, but it's something that is technically possible, right? And so common sense in this Gramscian um, frame of view means what are the ideas that we've been taught to think of as normal and how do they exclude other ways of being? Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. So I want to bring it back to this idea of the virgin whore dichotomy and why this is important. So the virgin whore dichotomy seems to have been around about as long as the concept of virginity itself, which is tied to the rise of the patriarchal nation state. So um, that's just a really, really long time. So historian Gerda Lerner wrote a book called The Creation of Patriarchy, and in it, she argues that in patriarchal cultures, men have honor and women have chastity. And so Lerner argues that a woman's value, instead of being in her honor, is in whether or not she has appropriate sexual behavior. Or another way of saying that would be that a woman's honor is purely sexual, whereas a man's honor can be in all kinds of things. It can be how he treats those beneath him, it can be how he treats his equals, it can be how he pays his debts. So the important thing to note here is that according to Lerner in a patriarchal culture, to be a virgin is how a woman gains value and social value in terms of honor or being a good woman. 
And so the other thing to note here, right, is that honor for men is a dynamic concept. It's something that you make and remake through all of your interactions with other people. And if you lose your honor because you did something dishonorable, you can work to regain it. You can work to be better. Whereas in contrast for women, if you lose your chastity, there's no getting that back. So honor for women is tied up in this idea of virginity before marriage and chastity within it. And it's not dynamic. It is static and fragile. In fact, my favorite kind of representation of this actually comes from Jane Austen. Let me see if I can find the quote for you. Um, so it's Austen in... Um, writing in Pride and Prejudice, my favorite book, and it's through the char character of Mary Bennett. Um, and I have completely lost this quote. I apologize. Um, here it is. The loss of virtue in a female is irretrievable. That one false step involves her in endless ruin, that her reputation is no less brittle than it is beautiful, and that she cannot be too much guarded in her behavior toward the undeserving of the other sex, right? So that's just this really poignant example that this concept of honor for women wrapped up in their virginity and their chastity is a very brittle concept. So once lost, it's lost forever. Um, one of the things that's important to note here is that for both honor and virginity or chastity, those are ways that people relate to men, right? So honor is a way that men relate to other men. And then virginity and chastity is a way that women relate to men, or I think it would be more accurate to say a way that men relate to women. And the reason for this kind of goes into why we have the concept of virginity in the first place. So virginity, as far as we can tell, co-evolved with this idea of patrilineal succession in patriarchal cultures. So really quickly, patriarchal cultures are cultures in which men hold the positions of power and authority. The word patrilineal means that possessions pass from father to son, right? So think of your classic monarchy where the king dies and it's his firstborn son that becomes the new king. That's kind of the classic example of patrilineal patriarchy. And so the concept of virginity evolved in this context to facilitate the passage of power and wealth and resources from father to son because to make sure that your resources went to your son you had to make sure that your wife hadn't had the opportunity to have a son with someone else hence rigid social enforcement of virginity before marriage and chastity within marriage so what this means in a very literal way is that men's value to each other is in this dynamic concept of honor. So how can we help each other? Whereas men's value in women is, can I be sure that you're going to have my son? And that is in this very brittle static category of virginity and chastity. So again, why is this important? Well, it's partly important because modern women aren't just asked to be a virgin or a whore, right? So uh, I'm not going to say no one, but very few people want to be categorized as a whore. There's a lot of kind of social not nice things that happen if you're categorized that way. Um, again, we see this in TV um, characters who fall into that bad woman or whore stereotype, we kind of rejoice when bad things happen to them. So uh, a recent-ish example would be Cersei Lannister, right? So she's that bad woman. She's kind of not playing into her role. She's certainly having a lot of sex. Um, but more importantly, she's trying to take power away from the men in her life uh, in really unethical ways. And, you know, I'll admit it, we hate her. I hate her. Um, we all kind of rejoice when she got her comeuppance, right? Um, and so we see this trope really clearly in media that bad women get punished and that good women um, get rewarded. So um, that kind of happens in real life too, right? We see this in... Um, 
<sighs> we see this all the time in um unfortunately rape cases right so um when the woman is asked if she had had sex before which is not relevant to the case at hand right but if she had if she was known to have a lot of sex sexual partners we know that courts and juries are less likely to convict the rapist in that case right so this idea that women who fall into the whore the bad woman category experience punishment is something we see in media and unfortunately in real life so hopefully you're already starting to see part of why this is a problem is because real women don't fall neatly into these stereotypes just like no real person falls into a stereotype and yet women are constantly asked to negotiate these stereotypes and in modern popular culture women are often asked to be both right be sexy but not slutty be confident but not aggressive smile but be assertive right so we're asked to do this kind of impossible dance of being kind of the strength of the whore with the innocence of the virgin right and what makes this all even harder is that these categories shift all the time and they're often defined by those in power right so we know that the majority of media executives are still men the majority of writers of film and comedy and television shows are still men so women are not representing their own experience and what women see in media as a normal woman is often a scripted idea of a man's ideal woman right and so um that becomes complicated when we ask women to navigate this kind of impossible routine of being all things because eventually a real woman is going to fail right um, and she may feel bad about that herself she may be punished on her performance review right if she was too assertive um, maybe she'll get a bad performance review saying that she's aggressive or not a team player um at the same time if she was too passive maybe she'll be told she didn't take enough leadership roles right these have consequences for real women and aspects of their everyday lives so last but never least i want to bring you to one of my favorite scholars angela mcrobby um she has a quote that i absolutely love um and it is choice is a modality of constraint and so um, if that sounds weird, think of that belt scene in The Devil Wears Prada, um, where Meryl Streep's character breaks down um, this idea that you think you have a choice about whatever sweater you want when you walk into the store, but in reality, fast fashion is imitating high fashion, and so your choices are already constrained by forces that you don't see. Right. So, for example, if I walked in to my local grocery store down the street um, and let's say I had unlimited money and I went into this grocery store and I can buy anything I want in this grocery store, I can buy out their whole stock if I want. Right. So many choices, but I'm already constrained by things I have no control over. Right. I can't buy what's not at the grocery store. And that wasn't a choice made by me. That was a choice made by the managers of the different departments right and approved by the store manager the choice that the managers made about what to have in stock this week was in part based on what their distributors had available and prices and sales trends over the past quarter right so there's all these factors i don't see and that i have very little control over that influence what i can buy so even in a world where you have a thousand choices um you're already constrained by these kind of macro cultural forces and that to me really sums up the heart of why the virgin whore dichotomy is important because in a world where there are many different types of women on tv right and in some ways it seems like we have more female role models than ever we are still constrained by these macro forces that we have so little control over, right? So if you wanna be any woman that you see on TV, the flip side of that is that you can only be any woman that you see on TV. And those women, again, as I mentioned, are largely written by male writers um, and their experiences with women, both good and bad, 
right? Um, and then whatever is written by writers may or may not be picked up by the network, right? And once it's picked up by the network, it usually goes through the sensors and has to make it through the sensors before it ever makes it to your eyes. So there's all of these layers of checks and constraints before it ever gets to you, right? And so that's why this virgin whore dichotomy is so important because when you start to look at media, you can really break down female characters into the good virginal character or the bad whore character. And so this makes real women and men feel like these are the two options of women and to treat them accordingly, right? Good women get respect, bad women get ignored or worse. So, um, I know that I'm not your teacher and I can't really give you assignments, but one of the things that I would encourage you to do is watch one of your favorite movies or one of your favorite TV shows and see if you can spot the virgin whore dichotomy at play. Um, if you don't want to ruin one of your favorite movies or favorite TV shows, I would say if there's a movie or show you've always kind of not liked but not been able to pinpoint why, go back and watch that and see if the virgin whore dichotomy is present and if that's what's been throwing you off the whole time. So thank you for listening to this little lecture about the virgin whore dichotomy. It's something that surrounds us in media all the time, but we very rarely think about. Um, I hope this has helped you understand a little bit more about virginity and its importance in our culture today and I can't wait to talk with you guys again.